This podcast is sponsored by Vicon, the Academy Award-winning developer of motion capture products for the life science, entertainment, and engineering industries. Vicon provides cutting-edge hardware and software with the highest accuracy. Shogun, Vicon's visual effects software, developed specifically for the needs of the VFX community, captures full-body and high-fidelity fingers effortlessly in real time and delivers robust, accurate, reliable data. Shogun now includes custom-developed virtual production tools to power your next-level project. Find out more at www.vicon.com. Oh, hello, Internet. This is Troy Baker, and I'm here with your lovely, very, very British host, Victoria Atkin. And this is the Performance Capture Podcast. So essentially, motion capture performers, like all the other performers, are here to tell stories. <laughs> and then they're like... <laughs> You mean there, there are actors in video games? I thought it was animation. I kind of created my position. Like, nobody said, oh, you know, here, you go to school to become a performance capture producer. I pretty much created my own career. I had done so much work, I felt like it was time for me to give back to the community that was so good to me. You know, the dots can tell if you're lying. Hi, everyone. We're back. This is season three of the Performance Capture Podcast, and we are so thrilled to be able to bring you eight brand new episodes. This season is packed with information about performance capture, so strike your T-pose and prepare yourself for another inspiring season of the Performance Capture Podcast with me, Victoria Atkin. Now, let's get started. Okay, everyone, I'm so excited. This is the Performance Capture Podcast with me, Victoria Atkin. Today, I have one of the most incredible actresses I've ever stepped foot on the Performance Capture stage with or ever really encountered in my life. I am thrilled that she has agreed to come on this podcast and share her wealth of wisdom. Uh, this episode really is going to be very, very incredible in a in its own very unique way. So I would like you to answer the first question for me. What is your name and where did you grow up? My name is Deborah Wilson and I grew up in New York City. And can you tell us a little bit about what you do, your title if you if you call yourself anything and uh, where do you work? What is your job? I don't have a title, but here's what I do. I do voiceover, I do motion capture. I act on camera, I do sketch comedy, I do improv comedy, I write, um, and I teach, and I do, uh, yes, performance, uh, quite a bit of performance capture and voiceover in a, a pretty wide plethora of voiceover. And uh, we always ask every guest that comes on this, um, because performance capture is something that has evolved and developed, uh, especially as us as actors and how we how we find it and how it comes to us. Uh, how would you best describe what performance capture is? Performance capture is simply acting. It's not a separation. I don't delineate that from anything else that I am designed to create. It is a space that you hold and you get a chance to create in, whether it be a set for a movie, an independent feature, a television show, or in what we call the volume. It is an opportunity to continue to develop character. It's an opportunity to continue to move emotionally through the space. And it is an opportunity to tell a story. Motion capture people are actors. They're there to tell stories. Voiceover people are actors. They're there to tell stories. People who do movies, people who are celebrities, people who are well-known, people who have won Academy Awards, people who have no, won no awards, people who do theater, the one thing that we all have in common is that we are here to tell stories. So essentially, motion capture performers, like all the other performers, are here to tell stories. And you get a chance to have whatever experience you want out of it. Thank you. Moving on from that, how did you discover performance capture and how did you become involved? What was your first project that you said, oh, what's this performance capture, motion capture? Had you heard of it before? I did not. And the first project was Avatar. Wow. And I was not hired to do motion capture. I was actually hired through Stan Winston's special effects company to be a model for the prototype of Zoe Saldana, who was the lead, as Netiri. And they had hired models and they weren't getting the performance out of what they needed because they were getting the body look, but not the performance. I was married at the time. My stepson was in Vancouver. He was coming to visit. 
and I wanted to do something that was really cool. I had a friend who worked in special effects at Stan Winston Studios. I asked if we could take her out to lunch via come and see her. She gave (laughs) us permission. We went into Stan Winston's workshop. The phenomenal stuff that he has done from previous movies, all the iconic props, all the iconic characters, all the iconic things that he had done were there on display in the conference room. And as we were walking through the workshops, other people who were working on a project called 880 noticed me from a series that I had done previously on Fox. It was a late night sketch comedy show called Mad TV. When we left, she called me a couple of weeks later and said, listen, they're working on a project and I know nothing about it. It's called 880 and they know who you were and they thought you would make a great model for this project. Would you come and allow them to take pictures of your body and movement? I said, absolutely. I wasn't working a lot at the time. I had already left Mad TV. And I said, just to have the experience, how wonderful Stan Winston Studios, although I don't know what it's about and I know you cannot tell me, I want to take that. I did. They told me, cat-like creature, when we're going to take a photo, you have to be completely still because we're going to CGI that photo. So we need you to be absolutely still. I said, tell me about the environment. Tell me about the temperature. Tell me about this. Those things in general, they can tell me. So I proceeded to take off my clothes. Because if I'm a humanoid or a cat-like creature, then these clothes get in the way because I wouldn't be wearing them. I have to feel comfortable in my skin so I can feel that there is fur on them, but I needed to be close to my skin and I couldn't do that with clothes on. So with their permission, I got undressed and I created an environment on basically on, on a, and it wasn't even a stage. Again, it's just like a, we were taking a picture in a room yeah. and they were using green screen. So I said, will you allow me just to explore the environment? And when I know that I'm completely immersed in the environment, I'll freeze. They said, sure. And they said, you're also an ascended humanoid being who loves her tribe, who takes care of her tribe, who's a part of her tribe, who um, is very in tuned with nature. And I said, perfect. So every time that I moved, every time that I did something, when I captured that position, they would take a picture. A year and a half later, I got a call from James Cameron's company (laughs) and they said, we started production on this project and your name came up and we, James Cameron wants you involved with the motion capture troupe because it didn't go through my agent. And because I didn't remember anything, I said, you have the wrong Deborah Wilson. You must go back to SAG-AFTRA and see if there's someone else. Maybe they had. Oh a my goodness! With an R, but I'm I don't know anything about this. And if it didn't come through my agency, and they don't know anything about this, I think you might be mistaken. And they said, "Well, that's odd because you were specifically asked for by James Cameron." And I was like, "I've never met James. I, well, I did meet James Cameron, but that's a whole other story." I said, "I I don't know anything <laughs> about motion capture. I have I don't I have no idea what you're even talking about. I don't know what that is. So I don't think it's me because I've never done that." in order for you to know me to do that. And I was about to hang up the time. And they said, well, I thought you modeled over at Stan Winston. So when they mentioned Stan Winston Studios, I said, yes, I did that. I modeled over at Stan Winston Studios. Okay, well, it was for a project called 880. Uh, Okay. And, well, they took those pictures. They showed them to James Cameron. He said, that's what I'm talking about. She holds the essence of what I want Neytiri to be. Wow. But because she's in these positions and what she's doing, I want her to be a part of the motion capture troupe because she can be, she can be one of these amazing um, Navi. That's what they're called, Navi. And so I said, I'm not looking stupid in front of James Cameron. Thank you for telling me everything that it is, but I, I, I'm going to decline. I don't, I, I, James Cameron, amazing and wonderful, but doing something in front of him that I have never done before with people who are already grounded in this particular aspect of the industry and what they do. Now that you're telling me, it might, I might be over my head and I would rather not do it than to be over my head and be overwhelmed in front of wow. a prolific director like James Cameron. And they said, you, basically they said, you don't say no to James Cameron. He really wants you. He asked for you by name once he knew who this model was. 
And so I said yes, and I went through the process um, of 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 the photos and um, the head casting and all of those things that I that were to prepare for this. And once I finally came into the motion capture volume, and once I was little by little seeing what everybody else was doing, and everyone, especially when it comes to motion capture and voiceover, people are accessible and open and kind and thoughtful and considerate yes. because there's no competition. Everyone is there to create, and it's not limited parts uh, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to being on front of camera where it's like, well, you're after this part, and so are 60 other women. Everyone was open and accessible, and I felt comfortable to learn and grow and be there, and I felt like I deserved to be here at that point. I really, truly deserved to be here. And when I walked in, James Cameron looked at me and goes, hi, Deborah." Wow. And it was uh, amazing and intense and wonderful to do what I know how to do and be in my comfort zone as performing, as emoting, as putting out that energy that I knew to do. And all I realized was it is the same. It is no different than anything else. I don't have to be concerned about the technical aspect of it. Let everyone else be concerned. But what I want to deliver is a performance that is grounded, that is real, that is organic, that is truthful, and that raises the vibration of telling this prolific story. James Cameron used me for a number of specific Navi. And when he came out with the coffee table book, that picture oh, yeah. that he inspired him, he made a centerfold in the book. Wow. Zoe Saldana as Netiri in the original Avatar, mm -hmm. he gave her a giant hole, a earlobe. He, he had oh, a, wow. a large opened earlobe because in the photo that he used of me that was CGI, I had been stretching my ears. And in that photo <laughs> that was turned, you could only see my left stretched lobe. And in the actual film and in the development of, of this beautiful character portrayed by Zoe Saldana, her left ear is, is stretched because of me. Well, not because of me, but James Cameron wow. was inspired to do that. And at the time I had dreadlocks. I've had a head shaved head now for eight years, but at the time I had long dreadlocks. Doesn't she wear like dreadlocks for the, for the performance captures? She's got some long that were added, videos of that. That were added to the, the head rig. Yes. Oh my goodness. Wow. I definitely think you just You've just smashed that question. Uh, I don't think anybody else can compete with that. What was your first project? Avatar, just a little one. Um, that was amazing. Thank you. So you've just, that story, I, I just feel so actually privileged to be able to ask you that question and hear that answer. But uh, moving on to that, what is your favorite thing about motion capture? I think you touched upon it with the no competition and um, being able to be so free. But what would you... What would you say is your favorite thing when you get booked on a uh, motion capture or performance capture job? What, what do you get excited about? Telling the story, going deep, going down the rabbit hole and telling the story because it requires and requests that every aspect and every fiber of your being show up. Because when you're in front of camera, you have the lights, you have the makeup, you have the wardrobe, you have the set, you have the experience in the environment that sets you there. In motion capture, you have your heart and you have the volume and it's up to you to fill that space with what you do best in telling a story. It is that, there's, there's nothing but yourselves and what you bring and what your teammates bring, their heart and soul and that colors the palette, that colors everything that you get to experience when there's actually physically nothing there. I don't believe in luck. I believe that every experience is meant to happen for you to discover how privileged you are and what a blessing and gift mm -hmm. that you have in the opportunity. Everything Definitely. for me that I do, I want the experience to be much larger than me and much more important than me, mm -hmm. which is why if I'm going to be in an, uh, uh, an integral part of it, I have to come bearing my body and my soul in telling this story because it is the story undoubtedly of existence in and of itself on one level or another. And it's a privilege to tell that story, whether it be a human story, a humanized story, uh, um, an alien story, an animal story, whatever it is, 
we as beings on this planet, we as existence in and of itself, are the story of life. And we get a chance to tell that so that others get a chance to look at an aspect of themselves. I don't want people for me to look at just my performance. I want people to feel something about their own existence and experience that raises their conscious vibration. That's always my deepest and truest intention whenever I do anything. I always find that um, whatever project I'm able to, to step onto, um, and I think we touched about this with the project we're doing right now, is, um, is the echo of how it, how it is in my life, the, the mirror that comes back to every single person that's working on the project, how the story mirrors parts of them that they either are dark or light or need to work on or need a reflection of to look at. Um, and I think perhaps that, that ties in with something that what you were just saying, that it's, it's, not, um, it's not luck at all. It's definitely a divine, you're supposed to be here. These particular people are supposed to be on this particular story to tell it. And it is necessary and mandatory because it doesn't first or initially require you to be a motion capture performer. It requires and requests of you to show up as a human being and be willing to explore the story and add yourself in the middle of it. From your vulnerability, bon vulnerability to your power, everything about who you are to tell this story. Because you can be taught, like with James Cameron, I can be taught to be uh, 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 how the process works. I can be taught how the actual technical process works. Putting on that suit and going into the volume and going into T-pose and everything else that is required and requested yeah. uh, to work on a motion capture project. That can be taught to me, but mm -hmm. putting your best foot forward in who you are as the individual that you are is the joy and the special sauce and spice to the project. I love that. I love it. And it's that, that mocap suit that gives that complete blank canvas that you can actually paint you and your soul and your contribution to the story from everything that you've experienced in life so far. I and discover more about yourself also. Definitely. Wow, I never even, wow, wow, because it's not just about the work. It's about growing your consciousness and going, wow, see, I expected this to, I'm making my money and I'm doing my thing and I'm having a good time and I'm telling the story. But wow, have I grown as a human being? Because even when you're no longer an actor, you'll always be a human being. What you leave on the planet, what you leave and the legacy that you leave you have to ask yourself, when I go, what are people going to say at me, to me at my memorial or funeral? Will they talk about just what I did or who I was? I love that. I love that. That makes this podcast accessible to anybody, anything. <laughs> this is nothing to do with performance capture now. We're moving way beyond. Um, so you've talked about some experiences that you've enjoyed on the motion capture stage. Is there any, any short stories that you can, something maybe that was funny or an incident or something that's happened with you in the mocap suits or on the stage that you want to share? There are plenty of them. There was a scene that I shot for... Um, a project called Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. It's a video game. Mm -hmm. And at one point in a very pivotal scene, a very pivotal scene, I had to scream, but the scream had to come from the inside of my body, not mm -hmm. from my voice, because I cause a rampage of death and destruction. And so I'm building to that place. I'm building to that place in which I'm, I'm going to create this destruction. And then I build to that scream within my body, my voice, my voice is, is, is within me. And I'm opening up my mouth, showing this anger and this rage. And as I do, this strain, again, because it's no voice, it's voiceless. Mm -hmm. But this strain comes out and comes out with it in the intensity of my body is this giant fart. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the set is silent. And all you hear in this moment as I open my voice is, <laughs> yeah, there's so many. We we've been exploring the snack table on our project at the moment, but I totally get that. Um, that certainly happened. That certainly happened to me too. <laughs> so, um, you have accomplished a lot of firsts for women of color in the entertainment industry. You're the first African American woman of Mad TV cast. You're the first Black female Jedi Knight in Star Wars franchise. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your journey as a woman of color in this business and your advice for performance capture? 
and people of colour working in this industry. And I guess that would move on to our, our question about advice in general that you would give to people listening who want to get into a similar field of performance capture. The first thing I would say is ignore everything about being a person of colour. Ignore your gender. Ignore your race. Ignore it all. Because who you are is malleable. The world wants to see you as that, so then you tell yourself, I must be seen as that. But you don't have to. You already know you're that. You know you're black. You know you're a woman. You know you're a man. You know you're a them, a they, an it. You know you're binary. You know this about you. Now, let it go. Because the world will hold you to what you hold yourself to. This is an aspect of the industry that does not care. This is an aspect of the industry that wants to see you create and be malleable and move beyond that if you can do it, if you believe you can. And there are a lot of fears and there are a lot of things going on that say, well, I see this person left this job because it was a biracial character and they're voicing it and they're white and they don't feel comfortable doing that anymore. And so they let that go and they let this go. And, you know, and I think that it's coming at a time where the Black Lives Matter movement is burgeoning on the, the breadth and the depth and the pinnacle of we will be recognized. 400 years of systemic racism, we will be recognized. And it's a very palpable time for all of this to come to this head, given the current state of affairs politically. But the bottom line is the one place where that doesn't have to be the case, where you can have a sense of freedom and a sense of joy and a sense of authenticity and acceptance of oneself is performance capture and motion capture. So the world will look at you and you are the first black woman. You are the first this. That's wonderful. That's great. But now I step aside from all of that and I release and relinquish that so I can do what I do best, which is to put my creative foot forward and tell stories. I am proud to be dragons and creatures and demons. I am proud to be children and babies and zombies. And when I do that, and when you play that game, and when you watch that story, and when you immerse yourself in that world, you then do not care that it's Deborah Wilson, the black woman, Deborah Wilson, the African American woman. Yes, with people, with, with being an avatar, you see that. I get that. But in the larger picture, women in the industry, especially when it comes to performance capture, are telling powerful stories, stories they were not telling before, or stories that are powerful for all women of all colors, of all races and all creeds, whereas in film and television, it was very, very specific. We're telling so many stories that are about powerful women. I've played more powerful women in performance capture than I have on camera doing film and television. Yeah, it's an incredible medium. I mean, I, I think I might have talked about this before on the podcast that I'm part of the Horizon Zero Dawn franchise with Aloy, who's a, a huge, um, you know, female character. Um, this is a really interesting conversation that we could definitely talk about a lot further. I do think that there that we do have this amazing area of playtime. But I do think that characters now, are, beca are even on the performance capture stage, are having to be the specific gender or race or ethnicity that has been written, even though before it may have been that everybody could play anything. So, for example, I didn't realize in Horizon Zero Dawn, I play uh, a Native American, two Native American characters. Now, I didn't realize when we were doing this on the performance capture stage that these characters would be of a different ethnicity to me. I had no idea. So I, you know, played and I became these characters and I was this mad cave painting woman who was amazing. In, and then it came out and they had a different skin color to me. Now, nobody ever said anything or anything, but now I, I feel, oh, was can I still... I'm confused and I'm interested for your perspective on that. You have a right to have an emotional question about it, but remember, your emotional question came up as the world around you was changing. I completely overstand and appreciate and respect your emotional gravity 
to whether or not um, you should play these characters. But the bottom line is, if you do the research and you respect what this character is and the parameters of these characters, then you should have an equal opportunity. That's the way I feel, because no one has stopped me from playing characters that were specifically written as little white boys or little white yeah. girls. Mm -hmm. Can I do yeah. this? And I've, I've even from the very beginning, I also used to do puppetry and I did a series called the Mr. Potato Head Show. And mm -hmm. Queen Sweet Potato was a, a, a yam, but they kind of made her look like Aretha Franklin and you had to sing. So you had to have like a soul sounding voice to sing an R&B type of voice. Yeah. And most of the prof most of the puppeteers in the entertainment industry at the time were white. Mm -hmm. And they felt uncomfortable trying to do an ethnic lilt. Mm -hmm. But they also had the skills as a puppeteer. I was brought in not as a puppeteer because I don't puppeteer. Mm -hmm. But I learned to puppeteer because I booked the role. But with the other actresses that were not of uh, uh, were not black i said you're creating and building yeah if you're not doing anything that's stereotypical and you feel you're not going in that direction or you just don't have a soul sounding voice singing wise that's a whole other story because there are things mm -hmm. that i'll look and go like you know what i just i don't do that impersonation i don't do that impression i don't do that sound like i know my wheelhouse and i think it's important to know your wheelhouse and then that's where, I, I, again, I say bringing in the make and measure of who you are as a human being, because it's a it's a commitment between what you do and who you are that says I can move forward with this or I choose not to. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think it's it's really important to have a discussion as souls, but also as different races and talk about this thing. I don't think that's been done enough. And um, especially as powerful women in this industry, I, I'm I'm really grateful for your for you sharing sharing this and to be able to have this conversation, I I feel very safe in in your in your arms, Deborah, talking about this thing. And I really I really appreciate you saying that as a as a soul to soul, but as a white woman to a, a, a woman of color, I, I think it's it's important that we are having these conversations too. And I think it's really interesting uh, for people to listen to that. I would applaud any effort that you made to playing a character that was of a different race. Because I, I know, again, the soul and the make and measure of who you are, Victoria, is I will do the research and I will do the work and I will do the emotional content to make sure that I am respectful and bringing this character to the life the way it deserves to be represented if they're not hiring someone else. And they know that what I do as a performance capture artist and what I do as an actress and what I have to do and bring to the table as a human being works for the project. Don't turn it down because this is a part of your growth to connect to the diaspora of us all. Just a last really quick thing before we wrap up, a tiny bit of advice on practical things on how you can get into performance capture. Some people said before about being very curious, being open, maybe talking to your agent and letting them know you wanted to be part of this medium, um, maybe networking with, with studios. What's something, that a, a practical piece of advice that you might give? A practical piece of advice is always hone your acting. It's a very, very important thing to do. I say, in the meantime, during this time of the coronavirus, get online. There are so many podcasts. There are so many uh, Q&As. There are so many panel discussions. Absorb yourself in all of it. Take that journey down the rabbit hole on YouTube and start doing that. Find out people who are in motion capture. Research who they are and through these podcasts and start finding out more about what this is all about. Uh, uh, the behind the scenes stuff. I mean, immerse yourself the same way that you would immerse yourself in discovering this great actor and seeing all their work and finding out, you know, all the things that they've done and, and watching them from character to character. Immerse yourself in that. That's the first thing I say. That's the, that's the very first piece of advice. Because if you are already acting, you're already in that space to continue the creative process. And this is also a part of the journey. But if you want to know motion capture, it is a blueprint. Go on YouTube and use everything as a blueprint to the pathway for what you want. Keep it in your mind, your heart and your head, but continue yeah. to take that rabbit hole journey down, you know, down that path to what you want to do by seeing others do it and being inspired by that to go when it's my time, 
I know enough as I continue to take the journey to yeah, learn I'm even ready. more. I've been offering some classes with performance capture with the pros. Maybe in the future you might want to chat on that too. Um, it just allowing people to learn from people that have already walked the path before. And we've been doing that on Zoom, which has been really, really very fun. Um, so finally, how can we find you on social media? If people have really enjoyed this interview, uh, what are your handles? Uh, how do we get in touch with you or how can we find out more? Believe it or not, I'm not on any social media whatsoever. <laughs> That's really good. So this is an exclusive, everyone. <laughs> but what the great thing is about uh, uh, this is I always say yes to podcasts and broadcasts and Q&As and panels um, because it gives me an opportunity to uh, share this expression so that people can get a chance to see themselves um, and their, their, their desires and their dreams to know that you are possible. If you take impossible and you separate the I am from the possible and put an apostrophe be between the I am, impossible becomes I'm possible. And I do it because I know I'm possible and therefore so are you. Thank you so much, Deborah Wilson. It has been an absolute honor to have you on this and an honor to be on the Performance Capture stage with you whilst we're recording this. Um, thank you. I, I long for more experiences with you in my life on this earth. And uh, I thank you so, so much for your involvement and contribution today. Thank you so much. Love you, goddess. Thank and you. on that note, mwah. Mwah. Love you. Thank you so much. Season three of the Performance Capture podcast was recorded and edited at Soundbox Studios in Los Angeles. Soundbox LA is the founding studio in the Soundbox Studio Group, a collective of talent-owned and operated boutique voiceover studios with multiple locations in the Los Angeles area and Southern Colorado. You can find out more at soundbox.la. We'd like to send out a huge thanks to Soundbox Studio City's very own Ryan Riveros for editing the episodes of season two and now season three. The multi-talented Ryan is also the composer of our theme music. <laughs>